happy to welcome um, Dr. Eustace Verhagen to the Monell seminar series. So actually, uh, it was the postdocs who uh, are inviting you. So I'm very excited about that. Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Verhagen got his master's in science in medical biology from the University of Amsterdam. And he uh, studied antioxidant potential of tea and wine components. He also worked on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in stress and development in rats at the University of Delaware. He did his graduate uh, research under um, the late Thomas Scott, and it was on gustatory coating in the taste thalamus, so the uh, parvicellar portion of the ventroposterior medial nucleus in rats. Uh, this was followed by a four-year postdoc under Professor Edmund Rawls at the University of Oxford, England, and he worked on multimodal neural coding of flavor-related multimodal and hedonic orosensory coding in the orbitofrontal cortex, amygdala, and anterior insula in non-human primates. He then uh, worked with a professor, uh, Matt Wachowiak, at Boston University, and he defined olfactory bulb coding to odors in awake, had fixed rats in relation to sniffing. Now, uh, since 2007, um, he has managed his own lab at the John B. Pierce Laboratory in Connecticut. He's a full fellow and associate professor at the Department of Neuroscience, Yale School of Medicine, and he has received um, uh, several grants from uh, NIDCD at NIH and also uh, from NSF. Um, his lab uh, explores multimodal retronasal smell coding in um, rats and my mice olfactory bulbs. Uh, he uh, studies odor navigation uh, and uh, realistic mouse models of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. He uses a lot of uh, various techniques uh, such as uh, calcium imaging, fMRI, electrophysiology, uh, behavior, and also uh, optogenetics. So I'm very excited to hear what you're going to tell us today, and the floor is all yours. Great, Jeremy. Thank you, Dolly. Um, first, I want to thank uh, you guys, Dolly, all the postdocs, for inviting me. It's a, it's a really great honor, um, a doubly honored, actually. Um, and uh, I also want to reminisce about, uh, about nine years ago when uh, Johannes and uh, Grammy hosted me so very gracefully and, and uh, at Monell, which was a, was a really great time. So uh, it's a shame that I can't be there in person. I'd love to, but uh, we do what we can. So unless I hope you enjoy my uh, my talk, find it useful, and thank you all for for attending. Um, so let me share my screen. Start at the start. So um, what I want to talk about today is are two different aspects of uh, dynamics in the olfactory system. And one pertaining to um, the dynamics of odor coding and what it might be good for. Um, and the other, uh, the dynamics of the odor stimulus itself, in particular how it is related to, um, uh, to odor plumes and navigation. So um, I'll, it's really two talks. It's a little dense, maybe denser than it should be, but uh, forgive me, I thought they actually worked well together. So I will start with um, trying to quantify stimulus information in the mouse lateral and dorsal olfactory bulb. And the second part about the uh, ability of mice to detect fluctuating odors based on their dynamics and the intermittency. Uh, so for the first part, this is actually sort of kind of a maybe somewhat typical uh, COVID experience where you maybe are a bit more reflective, reflective than usual. Um, this was based on a, a fairly large data set that was generated by my former post, Akili Baker, who is now at uh, the great lab of Alex Fleischmann in, in Brown. Um, she developed and spearheaded uh, the project of imaging both the lateral and the dorsal olfactory bulb in, uh, simultaneously. And um, it was sort of inspired by the last uh, uh, Society for Neuroscience, the, the chemo reception social that Alfredo organized. And uh, I, I met Edmund Rawls after a long time of not seeing him. And I, I 
as Dolly mentioned, I've I worked in the lab as a, as a postdoc for four years in the PACS and uh, also worked on information theory with him. And uh, he has had a very long uh, term interest in information theory. And so wanted to quantify uh, certain aspects of olfactory uh, coding. And so luckily Edmund was very eager, enthusiastic to, uh, to collaborate with us on that. So um, I want to contrast the dynamics of the olfactory coding with sort of the standard classical point of view of uh, odor maps, which is sort of dictated by a somewhat simplistic view of the molecular logic um, of uh, olfactory system. That is that the olfactory bulb, which is what my lab images, uh, contains glomeruli. And um, the idea is that each odor evokes a particular spatial pattern of activity. And that is dictated by the fact that olfactory receptor neurons uh, each express a unique olfactory receptor. Each receptor has a unique uh, uh, chemosensory repertoire, a, a receptive field, chemical receptive field, and they idiotypically converge onto one or two glomeruli in the shell of the olfactory bulb. So hence, an odor evokes a, a unique spatial pattern. Now that does not take into account a whole host of uh, processes, including sniffing or uh, absorption or differences in uh, uh, roots of uh, odor and passing through the olfactory epithelium. So it turns out that things are uh, much less static than early work using, for example, 2DG or fMRI uh, may have led us to believe, even though those were massive insights at a time and they remain highly valid. So um, long term, a uh, long time ago, uh, uh, people have posited that, that uh, odor information may be uh, uh, referenced relative to the sniff cycle, the, the sniff cycle being sort of a zeitgaver. Um, and the idea that it sets a temporal window of activation for different neurons across the olfactory system. Um, indeed, olfactory activity and sniffing have a strong relationship at both the level of the olfactory receptor neurons, they're tightly coupled. And that tight coupling actually appears to be enhanced at the subsequent projection neurons, the mitral ducted cells, across uh, various sniff frequencies. Um, so it also appears that olfactory information is encoded in the precise timing of odor evoked activity relative to the sniff cycle. Um, now, if that's true, um, is this actually perceptible? by mice. So Matt Smear and uh, in Dima Rimberg's lab performed a, a, a really sort of astonishing experiment where they uh, asked the mice to discriminate the timing of, uh, of stimulation of a, uh, 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 an optogenetic mouse uh, targeting a particular olfactory receptor. And it turns out that uh, relative to the onset of inhalation, mice were able to tell whether the optical stimulation occurred uh, 10 or, or 15 milliseconds after, uh, the, um, after the, the onset of the sniffing. So very high uh, uh, acuity to perceive sniff phase. Um, so it seems that timing relative to the sniff cycle is an important cue. It also shows that the mammalian olfactory can read this temporal information. There's also information about uh, in, in the dynamics um, in the in sniff independent measures. So if you look at the timing relative to glomeruli, so here you see a response to the dorsal olfactory bulb and response to sniffing, and now the odor comes on. You start to see patterns um, in responses, fluorescent patterns of calcium responses. And you see that these patterns are fairly unique from sniff to sniff, but also and that they evolve uh, for during each sniff cycle. And it is that uh, ev evolution of responses across glomeruli and glomerular clusters uh, that I call dynamics here, and that's what I'll be focusing on. 
And it turns out uh, that many factors uh, may influence this. It includes sniffing, uh, very chemical properties affect this due to adsorption. Uh, presumably pre inhibition um, will affect this. And we know also that outer root uh, affects these dynamics. Now, in what I consider a classic paper, uh, one of my favorite papers on olfaction, uh, Spores of Koviak, Cohen, and Friedrich found uh, that um, each odor uh, in the olfactory bulb um, evokes a unique sequence of activation, and that this is highly repeatable, um, and hence that uh, this also might contain information about which odor is present. So for example, um, here you see a response pattern to five different glomeruli, this to ethyl butyrate. See that across these four trials, the latency for this blue glomerulus um, is fairly consistent, is, and it follows uh, the sequence of activation of the other glomeruli you can see here. Now to oxaloacetate, the sequence is actually different. You see how the, this blue uh, glomerulus now uh, becomes later and later activated. Um, and so that this is quite uh, consistent. So this suggests that there's information here in the dynamics. And you presumably could decode which odor is presented just based on this. Um, Ryan Carey in uh, Matt Wachovia's lab there's a really nice overview of the dynamics. Um, he described this, and for example, the latency um, is about the latency of activation of glomeruli after a sniff inhalation is uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 milliseconds for the, for the most part. So we're talking a huge range, 100 milliseconds. Um, so um, then the question is, well, um, if there are these temporal differences, can mice actually discriminate these? And so there was a really nice paper uh, done by uh, Jago Restrepo, Tom Baza, uh, Dave Pryor, and Lee, which asked, um, if, irrespective of the sniff cycle, whether or to what extent mice can discriminate the length of um, odor uh, of, of light pulses in a general adoption mouse. And it turns out that again, uh, they are able to discriminate this down to mil uh, 10 milliseconds. If the, the, reference, the reference pulses were 100 milliseconds, they could start to discriminate uh, ones that are 110 or longer or 90 and shorter. So that's about a 10% a difference, just noticeable difference of 10 milliseconds. We asked uh, along the same time, 2014, uh, so a similar question, but approaches kind of differently. Uh, spared by Michelle Ribello, we projected movies on the olfactory bulbs of uh, Generodopsin thigh uh, mice, and sort of a 3D optogenetics thing. And uh, we what we did that by having sort of uh, sort of a pseudo naturalistic approach to simplify things a little bit. Um, we had uh, four interior glomerular cluster-like structures and for posterior clusters. And you can see that here, these interior and posterior. And these were projected onto the bulbs. And the reference for these animals in a go, no-go task was to tell whether these clusters were presented simultaneously or in the go case um, were, were phase shifted or time shifted, I should say. So the posterior ones were delayed, but otherwise at the same duration of uh, of stimulation. And it turns out that when we presented these mice, uh, one movie per trial, um, they were able to do, to discriminate the delayed from the, uh, from the undelayed by about 75 milliseconds, which puts it in the ballpark of the latency, uh, the normal latencies of about 100 and 200 milliseconds. So this might be usable for them. Um, however, when we started to be a bit more physiologically relevant and started to present one movie per sniff cycle, but jittered uh, relative to the actual exact onset of the sniff cycle, it turns out they were able to discriminate this down to about uh, you know, 10, 15 milliseconds. And it also turned out that 
it didn't really matter whether we delayed the uh, anterior relative to the posterior uh, glomerular cluster or the vice versa. To make sure this is also sort of biologically relevant, we actually imposed the uh, dynamics of uh, the of the olfactory bulb of um, an OMP GM3 mouse onto a chanerodopsin uh, thigh one mouse, and um, we uh, either kept the dynamics of that activity that we recorded in the um, in the GM3 mouse intact, so in a posterior glomeruli here. Uh, and the anterior glomeruli here, this is over time, the, uh, the delta F over F, or we made it a static movie, but retained the energy uh, over time. So the area under the curve was kept the same. And it turns out these animals were able to, uh, to do that at 75% accuracy. Um, so they could tell the difference between dynamic and static uh, representation and um, that also uh, uh, was not influenced by the presence or absence of uh, the eyes, which could potentially be another cue. I want to uh, bring your attention to a very cool new paper by Dima Rindberg and his graduate student Chang, um, which brings us to the next level. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it makes for a really interesting read and showing a lot of linearity in the variables that they explored. So the conclusion of all this is that the fine temporal structure of the odor evoked response at the level of the OB principal mitral tufted cells is functionally significant for odor perception. The dynamics of olfactory bulb odor map maps combined with timing relative, related uh, to the sniff phase implies a maximized transient information flow rate through the olfactory system. Now there's additional information that we gathered from work with odors. Um, and we found that uh, work led by Dan Wesson, that rodents are able to discriminate uh, odors with, um, uh, within about 200 milliseconds after a sniff onset. This was in, in Mavacopian's lab. Um, and that the decision, this decision to discriminate occurred well before uh, the glomeruli reached their peak response. Uh, and that led uh, Wilson and uh, and Kulikov and Serrano and Rindberg to, to term uh, primacy, suggesting that um, not only does the olfactory system need less than the full population for readout in certain tasks, but also less than, um, less than the total time of the response. So, but that still leaves open the question, how much, how does in odor information actually accrue during inhalation, and also um, how much information is present in the dynamics of these responses compared to the response rate. So what is the role of the static odor map compared to the dynamic odor map? For that, uh, you can use information theory, which can be applied to all kinds of systems. It's a very nice standardized approach um, and uh, it quantifies how much information neurons communicate to other neurons, in our case, about the stimulus set. The unit is uh, one bit, and one bit is gained if you reduce uncertainty uh, by half. Um, to give you an example, um, if you have eight every probable stimuli, such as tastes or odors, you can learn up to a maximum of three bits. And if you happen to have a neuron in a population that uniquely responds to one of those stimuli and your neuron happens to respond, then you know you have one of those stimuli, so you've actually learned uh, three bits. So um, with that, we'll, we'll uh, evaluate what neural activity carries information, uh, what happens to the information when you add neurons, how is a population representing this information about the stimulus set, and what is the information processing rate? Uh, I'll keep this part short, it's a little tricky, but um, it essentially has to do with uh, 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 
with probability distributions. So in order to estimate stimulus information, you look at the probability distribution of your uh, stimuli, um, the probability distribution of the response patterns, and uh, then also the conjoint, the joint uh, probability distribution. So that what are the probability distributions of the uh, of the uh, responses given a certain stimulus. Now, once you've done that, you're always limited by the number of trials you have in biology, um, and um, you have to you have to make uh, corrections for that. So that's something we've done, and um, I strongly recommend you read Neural Networks and Brain Function by Rolls and Travis. It's a really nice book. In addition to explore the population code information, and we use a decoding procedure. So you can imagine you have five cells um, and uh, their response pattern is given for three, three uh, stimuli here. And you're presented with a new pattern of responses. The question is what is, this, what is the most likely stimulus? And by using a decoding procedure, you can estimate what's called the mutual information. Um, and again, you have to correct for a limited number of trials here, and you can and perform cross-validation. So give you a, a, a give you a flavor of what the outcomes might be uh, looking at 13 orbital frontal cortex taste neurons, the second order taste cortex and odor cortex. Uh, we see that uh, when you add more and more neurons, uh, the information uh, about the stimulus set of six tastes increases less and less. So each additional neuron adds less and less information about which tastes uh, were presented on the tongue. And note that this scale goes from zero to two. The maximum here really is 2.6 because that is two log six. The maximum amount of information there is 2.6 bits more uh, uh, in, intuitive representation perhaps just simply the percent correct. So with these 13 cells you can get up to maybe 60 percent correct by which of the six stimuli was presented. For odor, uh, odor stimuli in 24 odor neurons uh, that were uh, decided based on their uh, ANOVA based ability to discriminate odors, um, it was found that or the opposite was happening, that each neuron seemed to add a, 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 a similar amount of information about which of the six odor stimuli was presented. So that suggests that uh, while the taste neurons, about taste are quite redundant, the odor representing neurons in the orbital frontal cortex and awake macaques are actually independent. So um, in general, just to give you an idea, the information about the stimulus is related to the uniqueness of the activity that it's evoked by that stimulus and also how variable uh, that information is on trial by trial basis. And um, across 135 over the frontal cortex days neurons, the most information was uh, about glucose. It's called a stimulus surprise, it's half a bit, and that was really due to the high sensitivity of those neurons to glucose. Um, in general, we found redundancy about taste and much less about odor information. So now back to the dorsal lateral olfactory bulb and the information quantification there. Just in brief, what we did um, in order to image both the dorsal and lateral olfactory bulb uh, glomerular input with calcium fluorescence uh, we set up two microscopes that image simultaneously and Ganesh Fazan from Vincent Pirabone's lab uh, helped us set up a, a LabVIEW VI system to perform that. We validated that they were simultaneous indeed. And uh, going from there, Keely Baker uh, uh, collected a nice data set, analyzed it, and uh, we presented that. Um, but in order to estimate information, Ideally, you don't really want to use calcium responses because the unit of activity uh, in the uh, neural system is the spike. So um, we went on to estimate the firing rate of uh, the glomeruli 
and we'll pack your bulb. We did that by knowing the temporal parameters of the calcium dye that we used. So this was uh, OMPG camp 6 f which is very high sensitivity and uh, a relatively fast dye, but still it has an offset and decay time of 140 milliseconds. So we went on to correct all our calcium responses uh, by deconvolving it with a filter uh, with a decay of 140 milliseconds. So that yields you then an estimated firing rate, not individual spikes, but a sort of a running estimate of the firing rate. Um, furthermore, um, every response was fitted with a double sigmoid, which helps in estimating the, uh, the shape of the response and estimating uh, uh, mathematically the, the peak, and the start, as well as the dynamics, meaning the time at which uh, you reach 10, 50, or 90% of the response amplitude. So these are temporal parameters. And for the dorsal and lateral bulb, you see here for amyl acetate, uh, the time to 90% of the peak response took about 220, 210 milliseconds. And it was maybe 170 or so for carbon. It was actually significantly different uh, for heptanone between the dorsal and lateral uh, olfactory bulb glomeruli. So dynamics on this end in milliseconds rate in terms of uh, actual overall accumulated uh, estimated firing rate. And that's much more equivalent to sort of the spatial codes or the, the map. So on top, the map, the, the actual rate, um, this is not deconvolved, this is actual delta F over F as we published. This is for mouse one. On top, we see uh, the left olfactory bulb, uh, dorsal olfactory bulb, uh, to different odors. In the bottom, we see the lateral olfactory bulb to the same odors. And this is our scale between zero and 43%. And Lord, I remember the time when we were imaging with calcium dyes that gave you a percent or 2%. Uh, and look where we got, it's great. Um, so uh, this is really nice. So you can see that hexanol uh, in this case, uh, for both the dorsal and the lateral factory bulb, they have very strong responses, say compared to carbone, which uh, only gave weak responses. Um, the dynamics on the other hand were scaled here for the same mouse between zero and 350 milliseconds. Um, and you can see that again for hexanol, the response uh, took quite a bit of time to, to reach 90% of the peak value um, versus, versus carbon, um, quite a bit less. Although the, L, the lateral factory bulb seemed to be, in, uh, to take a bit more time. We found in, in overall that the, uh, the rate and the, the dynamics were not necessarily uh, correlated. So there were, um, talk about that more. So as mentioned, um, for the um, information theoretical approach, you have to correct for the limited number of trials. And the PLOS biology paper, we only looked at the very first response. Um, but in order to increase the number of responses, we used the first five responses out of six or seven that we typically had available. Um, and uh, furthermore, we omitted animal three because uh, it had um, one stimulus less than the other. So we wanted to have five or uh, five or six stimuli. And we also got rid of benzaldehyde, which was only tested twice. So we had uh, two or three trials per odor per mouse and looking at five sniff response, sniff responses per uh, trial. So we're talking 10 or 15 responses, which is quite nice because you want to at least have as many um, responses as you have number of stimuli that you're trying to estimate the information for. So in total across these five animals, we we'll look at 330 glomeruli, 87 trials, about, uh, about 30,000 30, responses. Um, as I mentioned, every response was fitted with a double sigmoid. Um, in typical, the, 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 the correlation of the, the, the fit of the uh, 
est of estimated double sigmoid and the actual underlying deconvolved calcium data was, uh, as was sort of indicated here was a 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.95 or so. And 2% of the data was thrown out because it, was not, it didn't yield a fitable response. That data wasn't ignored. Um, in addition, and this may be of interest to some of you, um, we found uh, a degree of adaptation. So um, because we were now interested in all five responses, not just the first, uh, we found that on, on, and typically the first response was much stronger uh, in terms of amplitude as compared to the subsequent four, uh, which of course would introduce quite a bit of variation. Um, and so we analyzed it with and without compensation for that, uh, for that factor. Uh, and what we essentially did, we tried to retain all the natural variation uh, to the first response, but we scaled the first response based on the, its average size for a trial and, and an odor across all glomeruli and the size of the response average across all the other glomeruli. So they were all uniformly scaled on a trial by trial basis. Uh, the, 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 we call it the adaptation, but it doesn't matter so much. Uh, the effect was uh, a little, seemed to be a little uh, uh, less strong in the lateral factory bulb and also seemed to be much less in terms of the dynamics. The dynamics were quite similar between the first and the subsequent sniffs. Nonetheless, we adjusted it as well. All right, so how does odor information accumulate across glomeruli? So here is an example for mouse one in the dorsal factory bulb. Uh, this is the information as it grows um, across, uh, as you add glomeruli, you can learn up to 2.6 bits, see a rapid rise in information as you add glomeruli and it sort of elbows out at 10 glomeruli, and then it asymptotes at maybe half of the amount that you could know. So at least with these glomeruli from the dorsal bulb, um, you can know up to about half of which stimulus there is. Uh, in terms of percent correct, that's about 70%, where 16% is chance, so one over six. Um, typically, I'm not showing this, but if you add glomeruli from the lateral factory bulb, you don't learn much more. So there's, there's quite a bit of redundancy for this, this stimulus set. Uh, across the lateral and dorsal factory bulb, even though we used the static maps uh, based on 2DG by Mike Leon et al. Uh, to find stimuli that would also strongly evoke activity in the lateral factory bulb. Um, so when we make sort of a, a hyperbulb uh, by pulling all the glomeruli together across the dorsal and the lateral factory bulb from all the uh, from, from, from four mice, you can see that in that case, you are able to learn up to 95%. So um, it's possible that if you extend uh, into much larger number of glomeruli, uh, maybe if you do you know, really extensive mapping of individual glomeruli with uh, uh, two photon or three photon or something, uh, maybe you could learn more, not sure. Anyway, it seems to be that the reason for this redundancy is the, uh, the, the sparseness, the fairly broad uh, responsiveness in the glomerular that we tested uh, to the stimulus set. So how fast does the information accrue? Well, it turns out rather fast. Um, so each bin here is uh, 32 milliseconds. This is uh, five, a half a second uh, worth of uh, of data. And um, what you see here for, again, mouse one, the dorsal olfactory bulb, you see that there's a very rapid rise of at a rate of six and a half bits per second um, across uh, time. So there's a very rapid rise in information. And this 230 milliseconds is actually not that far off from the faster than 200 milliseconds uh, ability of animals to discriminate actual odors. So that's kind of coherent. Um, here it expressed in the percent correct. This is across uh, 43 glomeruli. Uh, it'd be interesting to know how it scales uh, across the dorsal and lateral factory, but we haven't 
yet looked into that, so there's there's more work to be done, but it looks like uh, there's sort of a burst-like information flow, and that's probably set up by the fact that animals have to sniff. Uh, so it's both a, maybe an impediment, you, you have a snapshot of sampling, compare that to the continuous analysis and addition or vision, but the system is probably also adapted to make the best of it and use sniffing to fine tune the system to detect whatever you need to detect. Now, this was uh, rather disappointing to me. I had high hopes for the dynamics to actually uh, provide quite a bit of information about the stimulus identity. It turns out that that was not the case uh, with one exception. So on average across these mice, uh, the rate gave about 1.1 bits about the stimulus set. Um, the temporal, oops, the temporal, here's my gel. Um, the temporal information was only point, only yielded 0.16 bits. Um, I thought based on uh, Spore's work and others that this would be quite a bit stronger. Um, but on average, that's what it, it, what it amounts to. And uh, furthermore, it, it does not appear that this temporal information, this dynamics information um, about the stimuli adds to the array. It doesn't. It, it looks like um, it doesn't really matter much. Sort of redundant with the rate information. So I, I, I was very disappointed, but uh, uh, Edmund Roll said, told you so. Like, all right. <laughs> Um, there's one exception, uh, that was mouse six, uh, especially the dorsal olfactory bulb, uh, gave pretty high amounts of information based on the dynamics. And uh, not sure why that is, I'm gonna be looking into that more, more carefully. Um, I honestly don't know, and it looks like that information and in dynamics um, actually added to the rate uh, information in red. So that the sum total information about the stimulus is higher. So to be continued, not sure what that is. So the conclusion so far is that uh, we can apply information theoretic approach to calcium imaging. You just need to be involved with it, to have sort of equivalence with the other literature and sort of the actual uh, readout. Um, it turns out that in our case, the glomeruli and the dorsal and lateral olfactory bulb seem to be quite redundant. At the same time, if you have a large number of glomeruli, this can add to a large amount of information. Perhaps that is why you need a large number of olfactory receptors. Um, at the same time, it would be really interesting to test this um, over a much larger set of odorants, especially odorants that are more naturalistic, such as mixtures. Um, in addition, response dynamics can, can encode some in odor information, um, but it seems to be much less typically than carried by the cumulative response rate. And it appears to be redundant typically with the cumulative response rate. So another question is how does this relate to awake mice? I mean, these, I forgot to say actually, these were uh, anesthetized head fixed mice. So I apologize. Uh, be important to ex to explore this in a way mice or rat. Um, so um, we found that uh, odor information accumulates within the first quarter of a second at six bit per second for five or six odors. Um, so that begs the question then: if if there is not much information in the dynamics, what is this high temporal acuity? of your factory system good for? And um, I pose that this may be particular for using the dynamic information that is residing in odor plumes and particular intermittency detection. And that leads me to my second part of my talk, which is uh, mouse detection of fluctuating odors based on intermittency is spearheaded by a PhD candidate, Akita Gomasta has done a fabulous job. Um, and there the question really is, as in a broader prospect, uh, how do animals navigate their odor environment? They need to know what the stimulus is, or what's the odor, how far is it, or 
how do you need to get, how do, how do you get there? And supposedly there's all this information present in an odor plume. It could be concentration, it could be temporal. Um, and it turns out that mammals and invertebrates have a large variety of behavioral approaches to uh, find the odor source, to find food or, or mates. Uh, most most well known is probably cast and surging, uh, where where uh, moths can uh, cast or surge upwind, so depending on where they are in the plume, and that's given that a plume is um, you know typically quite turbulent and means typically that it is like a sort of a crumpled piece of paper uh, where the paper represents an odor whiff and uh, the air is odorless air. So. It's a lot of times there's nothing there. Um, also know that the odor plume properties themselves affect how uh, insects and crested saiyans uh, perform odor navigation. And uh, in our lab, Ankita spareheaded uh, research that suggested that in a standard odor landscape that was uh, copied from John Kermaldi, a collaborator of us, um, animals uh, adjusted their navigation speed so that they actually uh, performed faster navigation in plumes with higher complexity. So that begs the question, how do animals process odor plume properties? And first, uh, I want to show you this uh, top view of uh, a planar laser um, induced fluorescence of acetone with a kick-ass UV laser. Um, so you can see there's sort of variation uh, of concentration over time here presented as a block concentration relative to the, uh, the concentration at the origin here. You can see that this is some of the concentration, but there's plenty of variation going on. Now, if you look at a somewhat different experiment uh, also done by another lab of uh, John Cromaldi, this case in an aquatic flume, this is a lateral view uh, where fluorescent dye is released in a, in a flow chamber of water with a defined um, uh, setup of uh, turbulence grid. Uh, you can see these strong whiffs of, uh, of odor. Um, and to some extent, aquatic and air situations are uh, comparable. Although it's not exactly clear how comparable they are in the details, but that's for the experts. So uh, one of the one of the uh, odor plume properties are sort of the dynamics, and um, as you can see um, here, uh, we have uh, the release of uh, of say acetone, uh, again imaged by John Cromaldi's team with uh, planar laser induced fluorescence, and um, and see how uh, close to the source um, yields a different temporal pattern than downstream from the source. And what we argue is that this downstream uh, source has a much lower intermittence, meaning that the, the, the amount of time that, a, that a odor whiff is present above a certain threshold is much lower. So there's actually information on how close you are to the source by this uh, intermittency, but the further you are from the source, the lower the intermittency, and um, so the longer, the, the, the less the duty cycle, in a sense, of the presence of the odor. Um, the question is, uh, we don't know much about how mammals odor navigate. Um, we know that they can perform stereo affection, for example. Um, but to what extent they can use this temporal information is unknown. And so uh, we decided to set up a go-no-go -no -go task uh, where uh, we had a range of high intermittency uh, traces that we played back through a rapid olfactometer to uh, six cat fixed OMPG and six F mice. Um, if they smelled that, then they had to go and lick. Uh, if the intermittency was very low, so it kind of sparse, temporally sparse. You had to withhold licking. 
Um, and then in addition, we had an ITI of four seconds, but if they performed uh, false alarms, as in licking on a no-go trial, um, then we added 10 seconds to the ITI. Um, we were also interested in the sort of the representation of the stimulus and what it would mean to them. So we made three stimuli. Uh, one was a sort of naturalistic uh, time trace, which was based on the PLIF imaged uh, plumes by Carmaldi. Um, or we made sort of an intermittency interpretation thereof by simply binarizing them, getting rid of all the uh, intermediate concentration levels and either have a, the odor being presented or not. And then last, we made a very simple uh, assumption that uh, maybe periodicity doesn't matter either. So we might as well play back a square wave, which is periodic. Um, and we can then also in a very systematic way vary the frequency. Uh, and where the duty cycle, the time that the square wave is on is equivalent to the intermittency. Last we varied the gain, which is we had trials where we had uh, the full concentration range. Um, and we had trials where we cut that concentration range in half. So we scaled everything by half. Um, if, for those of you who have seen the ECRO presentation by Ankita, um, all that data she repeated um, with this new uh, go no go setup where we varied the, the intermittency of the go trials uh, rather than the reverse. And also it turns out that uh, there was some variation in the flow rates as we varied the concentration of the odor and they were able to some extent to discriminate that. So part of that, in, of that data was maybe explainable by some odor uh, of, of flow rate fluctuations, not much. So we read the whole thing um, and uh, generated a counterbalanced olfactometer so that now the flow rate is very constant irrespective of uh, the concentration presented. Uh, the correlation is very high between what the, the steering signal, as in the, the, the synthetic or natural um, uh, 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 concentration that we wanted to present, and the actual uh, mini PID uh, measured uh, concentration, and here expressed as uh, intermittency, which is the important factor here. And um, there was a lag of 150 milliseconds, but uh, uh, yeah, very high very high correlation, the uh, lag itself doesn't pass. So um, to address the question where they can discriminate intermittency, uh, we use two odors, one uh, methyl valerate, and uh, for the naturalistic trace, uh, you can see that as the intermittency uh, started to become higher and higher, and more and more different from the low intermittency no-go uh, stimulus, the animals started to do better and better and better. So the hit rate reaching nearly 100%. And that was very similar for naturalistic, the binary or square wave stimuli, and even across uh, haptonym uh, to make sure that this was something that generalized well. Um, also found that when we reduced the concentration by half, uh, there was a small effect in their uh, hit rate, um, but not nearly enough to assume that animals actually were integrating intensity and time, which would be another way to uh, interpret intermittency. Uh, so rather than sort of uh, having a temporal representation, you could have an area under the curve over the entire duration of the Simmons presentation and uh, if your gain would be half, then your area on the curve would be half, and you'd expect uh, intermittency estimation to be uh, shifted by, by twice uh, the factor. And those shifts here, in, uh, here are uh, very, very small compared to uh, the full concentration range. Um, last, uh, as a control, uh, Ankita presented uh, odorless. Uh, stimuli still with flowing, uh, with air flowing, to so make sure that they're not paying attention to other cues. And you can see 
that in gray here that they really fail miserably when there's no odor present. So this behavior is driven by odor. Um, another question is, well, if it's not integration of the intensity, perhaps they're counting whiffs. Um, and it turns out that um, if, you, uh, if you ignore intermittency, then, and you just look at whiffs, the number of, uh, uh, of times they get an odor uh, pulse that is above threshold, uh, there's no effect on hit rate. So it doesn't seem that they're measuring or you know, estimating, counting the number of whiffs. Uh, in terms of the square wave, that'd be equivalent to the frequency of the square wave. So you can keep the, you keep the duty cycle the same, but you can increase the frequency of it and it has no effect. All right, so the next question is, well, are they actually adjusting their, their sniffing? Uh, is this something that they uh, might be doing to enhance their sensitivity to uh, the intermittency? And um, it is actually not a trivial thing to analyze, and Ankita has been fantastic in, in, in coming up with different ways of analyzing this question, um, and uh, a very uh, uh, reasonable approach simply to figure out um, when it is that uh, animals start to sniff fast. And that's simply defined as when sniffing is above the median sniff frequency of 4.7 hertz. When does that occur and what is the chance of that? So um, you see just an individual uh, trace. There's maybe a hint that at the onset, maybe sniffing rate goes down or the is the chance of that. And here uh, at the offset, maybe it goes up. So um, here you can see uh, across a whole bunch of trials that uh, indeed when the odor comes on, that's in blue here, uh, there's a subsequent decrease in the sniff rate or the chance of uh, high sniffing. And similarly, when the odor goes off, uh, there's an increase. Um, functionally, Maybe that is related to uh, sampling, the sampling rate. Um, if you are devoid of, uh, of if, you have, if you're not smelling any odor, perhaps increasing your sniff rate will allow you to more accurately find the edge in time of when the next odor whiff does come on. That's a potential interpretation. Uh, last, um, and Kia also analyzed uh, licking behavior, and she found that as um, uh, as the time of the trial increased, that the odds of animals licking uh, increased as well. Note that we allowed in every trial licking to occur during the trial, and we only we only explored licking uh, for reward purposes in the second after the stimulus was presented. So we can actually explore all kinds of, uh, of these behaviors. And uh, as it turned out, um, the time at which fast sniffing uh, started correlated very highly, well, highly, uh, explaining 25% with the time that, uh, that the first lick uh, occurred. So, um, and also uh, should be said that that occurred in, in, you know, without lag pretty much. Also, um, the, um, the more different the intermittency of the uh, stimulus was relative to the uh, no-go stimulus uh, meant that the animals started to look faster. So it seems that that could be related to arousal and the animal starts to expect a, uh, a water reward. Uh, could be related to certainty, could be, you know, all kinds of these kinds of things. It's interesting to speculate what it might be. All right, so overall these conclusions are that mice can discriminate differences in odor intermittency, which we didn't know before, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, they don't use time intensity integration for this, or they certainly don't rely on it. They don't count the number of whips, or at least they don't, they don't count on that or rely on that either. And they seem to be adjusting their sniffing to do that. 
We have some open issues. Um, we show that they can use intermittency discrimination, but we don't know if they actually use it. So some interesting experiments to be done there. Um, question is, does uh, olfactory bulb encoding facilitate intermittency discrimination? Uh, is that somehow interacting with sniffing? Um, something that we're looking into. And then somewhat speculatively, does the olfactory system's high temporal acuity that I talked about in the first part, does that perhaps predominantly serve to have accurate intermittency coding and hence to accurately and rapidly and fail safely uh, find your, or the source of odors and plumes? So um, I posed that code dynamics for odor dynamics and the code uh, rate is for odor identity. So dynamics of the code are for, for navigation and the rate are for uh, defining what it is that you're after. Okay, take home message um, two. Uh, while each SNP generates bursts of stimulus information, there's little stimulus information typically in the dynamics of glomerular responses of at least anesthetized mice. Meanwhile, mice can discriminate the dynamics of odor plumes across several modulated SNPs. That said, I want to uh, thank uh, Akita Gomaste for fantastic uh, intermittency work. She's really a star. Uh, she actually just was rewarded in NRSA, so we're all very excited about that. Uh, I want to thank John Grimaldi and Aaron Connor and Aaron Connor for their uh, wonderful plume data. That has been really a wonderful collaboration. I want to thank uh, Misha Isidorsak. She's a terrific technician in the lab and is currently uh, applying for grad school. She's wonderful. I want to thank Keely, who did the whole dorsolateral OB imaging project. Ganesh Fasan from uh, Vincent Peribone's lab for helping with the dual imaging setup. And last but certainly not least, uh, Edmund Rawls for this wonderful collaboration, his enthusiasm and his continued inspiration. So uh, thank you very much. I want to thank NIDCD for uh, their funding and NSF as well. And um, I'm hiring, uh, if anyone is interested in looking into odor navigation, uh, give me a shout, uh, very, uh, very uh, interested. So thank you very much for your interest. Thank you for, for the talk. Um, I'm going to start off with the questions and um, give some time for others to, um, um, you know, think about their questions. Uh, you can type uh, in the chat, raise your hands, or, um, you know, just um, chime in if you prefer that. Um, so you mentioned um, in the last part of the talk that, um, you know, there's coding dynamics and rate to encode different parameters, but this is with regards to um, the olfactory bulb uh, and what you found uh, with the imaging of the glomeruli, right? And yes. I, have, I have to ask, you know, what about the piriform cortex? Doesn't it play a role? It, you're making it seem like it's all about how the glomeruli are being activated. Um, I can't. I don't. I, I cannot tell you about the piriform cortex because it's just. I just don't have any data about it. Um, but I, I. You know, there's there are other researchers out there who have looked at at uh, piriform cortex and timing, and and it, it looks like a, it can be useful uh, in decoding temporal information. Um, and it can probably also be instructive for, for things like uh, concentration and variance, for example. So um, uh, it's hard to say uh, how one translates for the next, but um, I, 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 you know, I, I limit myself to the ball because that's what I know. Okay. Um, I, I do have another question about um, the odorants um, that you tried. I think all of them might be um, described as neutral odors. And I just wonder if you ever tried, um, you know, pleasant or unpleasant, um, you know, what we define um, as pleasant or unpleasant for the rodents. And if you ever think of trying those. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, and um, for, you know, using monomolecular odors that they have no experience with is sort of, you know, is, is very limited. And I, I, I agree. 
Um, at the same time, they have their benefits um, and, and that we can choose them based on how they, we know they are represented um, and uh, prior research and what have you. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, certainly, so not just uh, salience of stimuli or, or entrained uh, salience, uh, but also more mixtures. And, and um, I'm just thinking about an experiment perhaps with a Mavacovix odor gun where you can really do a boatload of repetitions with a boatload of stimuli and then explore that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would hope that these data generalize, uh, but uh, you know, to be continued, I think very much so. Okay. Yeah, that would that would be interesting because I always think of like food odors for me, for example, you know, like, but we don't know what happens with regards to glomerular uh, mapping, you know, of the odor itself. You know, there's just some behavioral experiments that people have done, uh, but we still don't know about the physiology and like what happens. So yeah, I feel like, yeah. you know. Right, in hunger state, um, yeah, for sure, yes. Does anyone have any uh, questions? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have, I'll, I'll um, sort of um, actually ask the question. Thank you very much for the talk, it was great. Um, so, so sort of your, your central conclusion that sort of the, the, the dynamics codes for order dynamics, uh, how, how does that sort of match with the, you know, the early bird takes the worm in terms of order ad identification? Are they sort of in, opposed to each other? As in primacy code? Yes. Um, um, well, I mean, we know from the from the looking at the the, the rise of the of the information uh, based on just rate. Um, so I showed this one slide, which showed like six bits per seconds of of, of rise of uh, uh, rise of rate. Um, may suggest that you that you accumulate information rapidly uh, without necessarily uh, having to rely on the variance across those rates across glomeruli. So um, the early bird may be enough because you're jet, you're you're um, accumulating uh, information fast enough based on rate alone. So so, so the the basically the information rate might catch up so quickly um, right. even right. within within sort of the first the, sort of the, the development of the dynamics that there is enough information transferred right uh, right to and, code and identity I, right and I, I think I think you're you're hitting the 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 the, the hammer on the head of the nail, the nail I guess is the expression <laughs> but uh, it, it, I think that's exactly the, the, the key question. Um, and um, and I I was not expecting this, so I'm very <laughs> reluctant to talk about it in this way because I truly did not think that it would be that um, simple. Um, but you no, know, the data is there, so it's what we've got to go with. Yeah. yeah. So the dynamics may not play much of a role in identification, mm -hmm. um, but I know it flies in the face of a lot of a lot of other evidence. So it, it'd be something to explore more. Yeah, it would be very interesting to see yeah, how it, yeah. how it mesh, meshes, meshes out. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so reluctantly. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. I don't know if you could uh, read it, Dr. Verhagen. I, I'm trying to see, yeah. maybe I should unshare in order to read the chat. Um, I, I I can read it to you also if you want. So uh, from Gonzalo Otatsu um, saying that it seems that the mice have more gramoli and receptors that it would need. Does this mean that with enough integration time, an animal with few receptor genes would behave as well as an animal with more receptors? And under more naturalistic conditions, with short brief pulses of odors, those extra receptors will then become more important. Hmm. Well, I, I, I appreciate the, the, the thought. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. I, I wanna stress uh, before going into that, that the, the, inf the information that we were estimating is strictly limited to the stimuli we presented. So 
I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure how this will generalize to more naturalistic conditions, which will be key. Um, so, but if you imagine that you not, are not trying to guess six odors, but actually whatever odors actually are presented in the, in the, in the natural environment of an animal, we're talking about, uh, I don't know, a million odors that need to be discriminated. And we're talking about, I don't know, uh, large numbers of bits. Um, so um, who knows how that would scale and how many glomeruli would be necessary, but presumably uh, a boatload, yeah, uh, thousands. Um, and if that is scaling linearly, it seems to be. I have a follow-up question to that. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so with regards to there being so many odors or objects to identify, and I don't know that I distinguish between odors and objects here since mm -hmm. the odor of a banana is banana. Um, but this gets back to Dolly's question about the role of cortex, or since I was raised as a psychologist, I'll say top-down inputs. Um, and you touched on Dima's science paper where he was making reference a little bit to there being learned patterns or engrams that you match the sample to, to, to motivate behavior or drive behavior forward. And of course, that kind of learning and matching the engram is top-down also. So if you think about it, uh, even more than there are odors in the world, there are, say, visual stimuli in the world. Since we can't smell the moon, but we can see the moon. So I could present you with an object and say, you know, is this a squirrel or a teapot or the moon or what is it you're looking at? And the number of bits of information necessary to, to wean that down is, is almost impossible because the number of the number of initial starting uh, stimuli is, is, you know, pretty close to infinite. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. requires having some idea of like what's in the world and, and, and what are the stimuli um, and life experience and learning so that with that, with that top down information, you don't need to go from a million or a hundred billion bits of information down to one. You only need to go from like six down to one, which can be done with, uh, processing of, of the inputs coming in and, and, and doing sort of what Dima's paper suggests, which is that more matching to engram idea. So what, in terms of what you're talking about, I mean, you can talk about it from the spatial or the timing or the coding, however you want to talk about it, but what do you think of the, the role of top-down processing in terms of your information analysis here? Hmm. I haven't really thought about that that much. So um uh, not not entirely sure um so let me so what, a different what, what, way, which is what what do you think of dima's paper then well i thought that to me the most interesting things about dima's paper are the um the the extension of um uh of the finds that we had and the the finding of uh to the, the, the strong <coughs> linearity of the um uh, uh, of the various uh, components uh, that they were varying in their optogenetic approach. So, um, and not so much the, the deeper interpretation, of course, they're, they're very interesting, but I was, I was more smitten just with the experiment itself. Um, so, but we're, so here, so I, I, was, I was referring to some of the orbital frontal cortex uh, data, right? And, and, and there, and I, I get your point, and it is a bit of a common, uh, issue that's brought up with information coding, well, how much information should there be out there? Um, another way of looking at it, it's uh, like, okay, well, maybe it's just task specific, or in terms of the orbital frontal cortex, um, you're talking about something that's strongly related to liking and disliking. So maybe the only thing that really matters is one dimension. It's like, okay, uh, how many, you know, how, how important is that? Um, so um, I think maybe the answer is that it's contextual or it depends on the question and that um, 
that, that the information theoretical approach is valid within the context that you're looking at it. Um, so I think I think that's that's really all I have to say. Other than that, you know, the top-down uh, uh, modulation or so of the input is, you know, is is there's something there? There's there's some modulation of input uh, by by fear, for example, fear conditioning. Um, but I don't know that the representation of 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 the input activity of the bulb is that strongly affected, as we know at this point, by top-down information. I would, I would think, but maybe it is. Maybe that is also dependent on how much top-down activity modulates sampling behavior, for example, or what have you. Does that address it? I don't know. I should have thought more about it, perhaps. It certainly addresses it. Sorry, I'm a psychologist. I can't help that. But um, yes, that's, that's, that's helpful. I, and I, I know that, that mouse sniffing is not as complicated as, uh, as say, dog sniffing is. But I know that, that dogs engage in very radically different kinds of sniffing behavior when they're smelling. They have at least four different types of sniffing. And I'm wondering if you know anything about the plume kinetics or dynamics with regards to how that interacts with the sniffing behavior. Um, I know that mice probably don't do all these different kinds of sniffing things that dogs do. Right? Now, to me, to me the, the only thing that really comes to mind is, uh, is the effect that sniffing has on the plume itself. As in, uh, there's this somewhat famous uh, work that shows how inhalation versus exhalation may uh, bring uh, odorants out into the uh, to be inhaled uh, air, and uh, exhalation would disperse what has already been inhaled. So you're so you're sort of enhancing the novelty, I guess, of the sampling. Um, I know there's there's some continuous modes of of sniffing of, of smelling in 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 dogs as they run or so right and sort of let it run through their their cavity. I I I I I think it's early early days. It's also early days in terms of understanding the dynamics of uh, plumes themselves and in the collaboration that we have in the neuronex context. Uh, we're just starting to look at you know how the reasonable complexities in the environment may systematically affect plume statistics. Like right now, things are fairly simple, have been very simple, um, but those dynamics are probably going to be quite complicated when you start to have a more naturalistic environmental representation thereof. So, um, but you know, definitely mode of sensing affects or interacts with what they're sensing. So it's complicated. Um, if you're interested, uh, Lucia Jacobs has some interesting work on dogs and uh, sensing in plumes, if you're interested in that. I can see a chat. Um, I guess there's, um, I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat. Um, if this is all, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Verhagen again, and uh, I guess some of us will meet with you later. Thank you so much for your time.